issue you're working on? We are working on mental health, and ours was specifically focused on the youth group. Okay. So this is team number nine working on mental health. They have three minutes on the clock. Here's our friend Molly. You need to name as many items as you can from a kitchen. <laughs> no. Okay. That would be easy. So num three minutes on the clock, and they start whenever Mel Molly tells you to go. You ask us if this is compelling. The statistics alone are compelling. North Dakota has a suicide rate in, among youth two times that of the national average. And for Native American youth, it's even higher than that. The statistics alone are compelling. And we are asking our youth to tell us, how can we save you? You ask us if it's a community need and an organizational fit. North Dakota, excuse me, NDSU Extension knows youth and families. It is what we do. This will require partnership with other agencies, mental health professionals and other agencies who serve these populations. Partnerships are what we do at NDSU Extension. Is it a unique value proposition? Mental health is a lifelong unique value. And we're building skills among our youth that will last them their whole life and will hopefully bring into their families skills and um, mental wellness. Um, our clear ask would be money to pay consultants. We want to make sure everything we do is informed by mental health consultants and we're partnering with them. We would also want some funding for organizing our youth to help us. It's, this will be youth driven from the very beginning. And so we would need money to bring them together, to feed them, possibly have um, retreats or camps of some kind, certainly day long um, sessions where they can be a part of our planning. So. Um, is it innovative? It's a new audience in that we do youth at NDSU Extension, we do a lot of 4-H, but this might be a different audience than the, our 4-H kids. This will bring in all youth and include all um, demographics of youth. So that's what I have. Does anyone have anything else to add in one minute? Again, youth will be involved in the design and the development and the delivery of this program. Anybody else from our team have anything to add? One minute. Thank you. A vote for us is a vote for North Dakota youth. So don't feel that you have to go the entire time because the sooner you get done, the faster I get to go home. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so the judges now have three minutes, two minutes now to answer questions or ask questions. and people who work with the youth in communities, even 4-H agents, school counselors, we're going to take recommendations and even put information out on social media for youth that would like to be a part of this, too. And I just wanted to add that we had discussed having focus groups or talking circles of youth throughout the entire state. So we're getting um, you know, youth from all different areas because we know that different areas of North Dakota are different. Um, and we're also going to get those underserved populations as well. How long do you do expect to take to develop the program? Like, do you want to talk to the lady? Yeah. Well, I think um, it'll take some time to do the focus groups and do some of and do some of that. But I think while we're doing that, we can also do some searches for what extension also has in other states and take advantage of some of the materials that are available nationwide and begin to show some of those things to the youth that we're meeting with and partners to see if we can use that as a springboard to develop what we want to use here in North Dakota. I would say one of the other key pieces we'd look at is actually the mental health first aid training that's available just for youth, and that would be another key resource for us. Uh, do you have a target group of mental health professionals that you're going to tap into to assist you in this program? I think we'd start with school counselors because they're already working with, the, with youth, and they already have programming that may just have pockets that need to be filled in or, you know, spaces that they would be our best resource to start with. So. Okay, thank you, team number nine. You can...
Find your way off the stage. We wanted to expand on our idea that we presented in the last pitch, so it was easy to focus on cleaning weed seeds out of combines because that's a pretty tangible idea. But we do actually have research that shows there can be 150 pounds of biomass in a combine that we clean out. And that's not all weed seeds, that's also things like corn debris that could be hosting things like uh, the, the bacteria that causes Gauss's wilt. Because we're the pest management team, not the weed science team, and we need to focus on everything. So at our clinics, there would be combines there, yes. We also need to look at planters and cultivation equipment. We could easily pull off a chunk of soil. You know, I could tell someone probably how much weed seed is in that chunk of soil on a planter. I don't know how many uh, SCN nematodes are in there or the soil uh, pathogens that are in there, but we have people in this room that can also be part of those clinics and tell us those numbers. Uh, beyond planters, beyond cultivators, uh, we have a lot of scouts in the state that use ATVs to scout fields. A year like 2019 where uh, fields were wet all year, that's a lot of soil movement across a lot of counties uh, with our scouts that are putting on these programs. Uh, beyond ATVs, so that's just kind of looking at soil cleaning out that really focuses a lot on weeds, pathogens, SCN. We have a lot of entomologists on the stage. We also talked about calibration clinics. So when we talk about sprayer calibration, now, you know, my focus tends to be weeds. However, we have a situation right now where a lot of pesticide labels for herbicides, we need large droplets to prevent off-target movement of pesticides. A large droplet may be good for weeds, but it is not good for insect control. So if we want to tank mix a herbicide with an insecticide, we're looking at a system where we may not be optimizing that insecticide and leading to potentially more insecticide resistance because we're not getting the right spray uh, droplet quality down to, uh, to the insects on, on the plants. Same things with fungicides and pathogens. So that's some of the things that we can focus on in the clinics. We can provide real data there at the clinics. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, and really that, that's kind of a, a good launching point to focus on these things. Farmers love getting their hands on equipment. And you know, the other benefit that I see to our, our vision and our dream, uh, we have some infra infrastructure in place. We have RECs with large equipment where we can hold these, uh, these programs. We also do need to tap into some of our uh, industry um, uh, people that we work with. So ag dealers, uh, agrochemical companies, they can also bring in a lot of people to sponsor programs. So that's another good benefit to our program is $5,000 is probably a really good launching point. We have some, uh, some pamphlets that we can print for some research that we've conducted about equipment sanitation. And then we can also use some of that money for advertisement as well. We're just about out of time, so that's the, the main points that we want to get across in this three minute pitch. So how many clinics do you anticipate holding? So we'd probably start, you know, five to ten might be a little aggressive in one year depending on who's involved, uh, but we do need to hit all corners of the state. You know, we focus on the southeast, uh, you know, and our pitches so far, but we've got a whole lot of uh, territory to cover, and we've got, how many RECs do we have? Seven. seven. I mean, so seven might be a good number to start, just to host it at areas where we have large equipment and depending on success, could expand from there. Do you have any plans to do any additional training to professionals to, to help spread this throughout the state? Yeah, so, you know, we're kind of hoping professionals will be a part of these clinics as well. Um, just because to, to host one these days with the equipment there that's also dirty, we, also, we really need to target times a year when professionals and farmers aren't very busy. So for example, this fall would be a, a not a good fall to do this. So we're really hoping the first couple ones to include as many people as possible. And then we guarantee that a lot of uh, industry professionals will be on board with this and interested. And then they can go off and kind of host their own similar field days. So can really have a kind of a top down effect starting with extension. As you're cleaning these combines out on the road, have you thought about checking the loads of hay also? Loads of hay are also a, a very good way to spread pathogens that are on there, weed seed, and, and, and a lot of bugs get uh, transferred on hay as well. So 
once again, we, we kind of focused on the equipment side, but this could really expand to a lot more just because we're losing chemistry, so we need to focus on more things with uh, re uh, reducing pesticide resistance. Ready? How many hours a week do you really spend at work? If we're being re realistic, many people exceed 40 hours, especially in extension. With most of a person's day typically spent at work in a workforce of over 380,000, an initiative targeting work sites could reach a sizable segment of North Dakota adults, recognizing that over 63% of North Dakota adults are obese or overweight. Our initiative seeks to meet people where they are located. It is a workplace wellness toolkit, but not just any ordinary toolkit. This toolkit is designed to take an individualized approach to health promotion, allowing organizations to address their specific needs. It empowers organizations and businesses to actively promote employee health and create a culture where employee well-being matters. So what makes this toolkit unique? We are targeting our effort where people spend most of their day. Unlike other wellness initiatives, this toolkit includes an assessment of the workplace environment through a score. Hello? Okay. Where did I leave off? Okay. The scorecard shows the current helpful measures and strategies work sites are practicing and identifies opportunities for improvement. What do these strategies include? Guidance on the formation of wellness committees, development of work site wellness policies, health and physical education programs offering our suite of health and nutrition literature and programs, and environmental changes to encourage healthy behaviors. Organizations and businesses can adopt one or two strategies each year. One strategy is not of higher value than another, allowing work sites to choose the strategies that best fit their organization. The work sites, not extension, are responsible for implementing these changes. They are the ones investing in their employees. Why do we think this will be successful? We already have solid partnerships built with our state health department, insurance companies, and communities. We have the reach to support our work and the skills to provide unparalleled support to organizations. This cool toolkit will improve the lives of North Dakotans, improve absenteeism, productivity, and workplace satisfaction. In addition, we see this as a way to diversify our funding and gener generate revenue. The initiative empowers organizations and businesses to actively promote employee health and create a culture where employee well-beings matter. If you believe in improving the lives of our workforce, vote for for work site wellness. Thank you. Um, in five years, if you were to evaluate your program, which two things would be the most important results you would like to see? Do you mind, sorry? I can hold it again. Thank you. So with the toolkit, we have the scorecard, and on that scorecard would be a slew of different strategies that they could adopt. I would think that maybe them adopting a well, uh, work site wellness policy would be something that we would want to see as an outcome. But honestly, we don't expect them to adopt certain strategies over another. It's just really what works well for that particular site because all work sites are different, so we would want to be accommodating. But we would have a pre- um, scorecard assessment and we would have post scorecard assessments periodically just to see how much they are adopting those changes. So uh, what sorts of things would be in this um, toolkit that you would provide to the businesses? Uh, so in this toolkit we think that there would be several pieces to it. One thing that we mentioned was the scorecard, and that's really assessing different aspects of the workplace itself. So looking at the different policies. Do they have anything in place? If not, what can we help them with? We have a lot of resources already that we might be able to bring to the table. Um, direct education, but also those environmental pieces. So being able to um, set aside the, or look at the environment and see what places could promote wellness and health in a business. Another piece that we looked at was to develop um, 
what we call like cheerleading messages, where they're using social media through their, their companies' uh, communications to encourage each other to adapt strate strategies. Ooh, sorry. Well, hi, Dr. Efforts. I, I'm here. I have concerns about my family. My, my children just seem like they spend a lot of time on their video games and computer and their phones, and I'm a little concerned about their health. What do you recommend? Well, I see when I look at their chart that you're both your son and daughter have, um, they're a little bit above the weight for height. So what kind of activities do you do as a family? Well, schedules are so busy. We've got them in sports and whatnot, but what would you recommend? Well, it's really important. I know sometimes kids are in sports, but it's more important for the whole family to do activities together. Mm -hmm. okay. Hi, Linda. Okay. How are you today? <laughs> well, I just left the doctor's office, and he's saying we need to do more things as a family. Oh, that's a great idea. And you know what? I have this great app I just uploaded, NDSU Extension Service. It is awesome. And I, I think you should upload it onto your phone. Have you used it? I have. I'm tracking uh, physical activity with my family. It gives me ideas on what kind of activities I can do, and it even gives me some recipes for healthy meals. So if I go to an app store and I look for NDSU Extension Health, I can find it. Exactly. Go, girl. Thank you. <laughs> um. <clears throat> So with being aware of uh, adult obesity, uh, just a couple fun facts about that. 35% uh, of adults in North Dakota are considered obese. And uh, with the highlight of the screen time for our kids, uh, upwards between six to seven hours a day for some youth, um, that brings us to the NDSU Extension app. Uh, which will be your one, your one stop shop for communities to access up to date and relevant information that will make it not difficult to live a healthy lifestyle. The app will help families track physical activity that will result in connection, enhanced health, and sustainable lifestyles. Um, partners in the community will enter events and workshops in addition to the NDSU Extension programs, projects, PSE efforts, um, including all disciplines across uh, the extension, uh, extension as a whole, um, anywhere from family nights for schools, uh, what produce is in season at the local farmer's market where you can double up your SNAP dollars and, and increase access to affordable healthy foods, um, all in this one app with research base resources and expertise that applies directly to each community needs and so that community can value, utilize it, uh, seek out, share it with their families, and um, in the end, result in a positive and collective impact throughout our communities. Um, so to be imperative, that extension as a whole, adopt and get around the idea as this, it, as this is the future of our communities. Thank you. New app. Uh, this is a new app. Yes. So will it interact with, say, Garmin or Fitbits or any of those other things that are already kind of doing this same thing? Those are some of the technical and logistical details that we haven't yet figured out because our expertise is not in technology and IT. So we would also rely on some of the other experts in the room um, and maybe consultants who could help us with that. So would this, would this app contain um, ideas for, for good family activities to do together as well as cooking and those sorts of things? Yes, absolutely. Um, there would be built-in prompts and notifications. So for activities and community events that are happening in your community, and it would be very specific to the local community or county. So um, Bowman would be getting Bowman information and Pemina would be getting Pemina information and those kinds of things. Any more questions from the judges? If not, okay, give them a hand. Just would like to start out by saying our idea is not only highly innovative, but fairly straightforward and simple to implement. 
Um, while eventually we'd like to see art, uh, these exhibits across the entire state showcasing different aspects of agriculture, we'd like to start with a pilot program in a high traffic area near campus, something large that draws peoples in. Uh, what we're envisioning is a, uh, a mural that includes sculptures and educational displays where they feel immersed in the environment and are uh, really something that they come into, but we're not chasing people down uh, to get them to learn about agriculture. Uh, this would uh, help local artists and students and give them an opportunity to receive scholarships or stipends, as well as visibility for their art. Um, we would need funding for materials, displays, and commissioning artists. So um, while the mural itself would be somewhat uh, informative, we would also try to incorporate things like QR codes. Yeah, so let's talk impact. National parks, along with other uh, opportunities, have now established QR codes that invite that person that's coming out to take a selfie or whatnot to scan that QR code, and it's linked to scienti scientifically driven research facts. And so what we could do is incorporate that scientific facts along with the QR code associated with this particular engagement. Along with that would also be hashtags, so we can measure hashtags, we could measure the QR scan codes, along with other social media. Also, we would work with opportunities to gain the testimonials of people from visiting those particular locations. So we'd like to work with commodity groups to kind of set what the standards would be for the artists to follow, and we'd review the different uh, submissions from artists and go from there. Um, while we'd like to have this kind of more uh, across the state, um, people like to collect things, right? So you go to monuments and you see these penny presses, right? So we'd like to have these penny presses throughout the states where they could, uh, as people are traveling through the state, they can pass a penny, a penny and see what commodity is grown in that area and they got to collect all the crops that are grown in North Dakota over time, right? So. Uh, there would be a few different aspects to this that are fairly simple to implement, but it's just to kind of get people talking about agriculture. We can't bridge that disconnect with the mural, but we can at least start the conversation and start to bring people closer to agriculture. So. Excellent. Uh, so would, would this be... Um to commission like new artwork in in Fargo uh, to begin, and then are you planning on using existing artwork or something like that across the state? Or I mean, we'd have to ask people, right? We can't guarantee that we could do it, but it'd be nice to do it at pe places people already stop, right? So um, you think of your rest stops along the state. Um, yeah, it would be commissioning the art. We wouldn't be designing it ourselves, but we'd set the standards. I'm somewhat artistic, but not that artistic. So I'm not, uh, but yeah, um, we'd be commissioning. And then eventually we'd, we'd try to go towards things like New Salem Sioux or the Enchanted Highway, that kind of stuff where people are already stopping. Um, yeah, fairs, music, fetchals. Um, just to uh, echo that too, it would give us the opportunity to have like selfie art and that would um, engage in that too. Somebody could create what is selfie art besides just angel wings, that artist would be the one to design and incorporate that. So would there be educational materials or educational graphics there other than, or are you relying kind of on attendees to talk amongst themselves? Um, attendees talking amongst themselves, but uh, so the main mural itself wouldn't be a giant infographic because who wants to take a picture of an infographic, right? But around the area there would be, like say you go to Painted Canyon, you have the little infographic that shows information about the history of how those uh, landscapes formed. So you could have those little things near there, and then you can also kind of get some of that information through the QR codes, but um, the mural and that kind of stuff itself wouldn't be the infographic. There would be things around there. So you're drawing people there with that, but while they're there, then they can learn that kind of stuff. All right. Thank you. All right. One of the greatest misconceptions I've recently heard when I was at the store shopping for my favorite food item was, I'm gonna buy organic because it's not sprayed. That is just one of the many brain-bending issues today's agriculture industry is facing. 
Our team's goal is to educate consumers so that they make food choices based on unbiased information rather than based on fear and misinformation. To start our project, we're going to create a focus group of producers, grocery store management, moms groups, and other community members to help us plan our program, create, and also to ensure use and impact. To be good stewards of the knowledge base here at NDSU and the land that we live and work in, we propose an immersive learning platform for the local populace that teaches where the food in the grocery store comes from, who produces it, why it's produced, how it's grown, raised, processed, which will enable consumers to make informed decisions about the food that they eat as opposed to fear-based choices based on misinformation. How we hope to plan to see this uh, project through fruition is we want to try, we are going to uh, create a website that is both mobile and um, computer friendly as well as interactive that consumers as they're going through the grocery store can click on different sections of the grocery store, say the produce section, the meat section, dairy section, see some of the common myths that are portrayed against those commodities and be able to get fact-based information uh, to use as they make their purchases. We also hope to see signs with some of this other fact-based information throughout the store in those sections as well. And we want to have ask a producer kiosks where producers that we would recruit for this program would would come, they'd be able to answer questions consumers have based on what they grow, the different ways they raise it. Um, we are always wanting to, in extension, build those trusting relationships with consumers. So our ask, we need the help of everyone. This is going to be a multidisciplinary project involving specialists, ag agents, and FCW. Uh, we need the experts, our specialists, to provide the information to help us develop the information. We need ag communication to help us develop the website and other associated materials. And we'll also need uh, producers who are willing to help us video uh, both their farms, but also to video them talking about what they do and why they do this. We intend to pilot our project in a large supermarket, say in Bismarck, and also pilot it in a smaller supermarket in uh, a small town, say Washburn, so that we can see how this program works. Uh, we intend to measure our information based on how many website hits. We'll also use Facebook, Twitter, and surveys to help gather information about how people are changing their habits or what they're seeing from our program. Do we have any questions from the judges? So do you anticipate then that people will be grocery shopping and then going to this website? Is that how this will work? Or is this something that they would do at another time or, or while they're shopping? It'll be both. We intend to have um, like locations where they can get a code or they can go to a website where they can learn more about that. But we'll also have cards and information that they can read right there. So we intend it to be both options. How do you intend to compete with the other advertisers in the store? How do you, what's going to grab the attention versus what they're putting out? We're going to collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> we don't intend to compete. We collaborate. All right, thank you. All right, so y'all liked our first pitch. Let us tell you some more. Okay, picture it. A world where NDSU is not confused with UNL. <laughs> TJ. <laughs> now picture it. An online promotional store where we have customizable options for you. Not just apparel. We have pens, picture backdrops, tablecloths, banners, baseball caps, all the things that you have been asking us for even this week. All right. So how are we going to do that? Uh, Keisha was asked by one of our state senators, where's the pork in extension? So, ELT, I'm going to ask you, where's the pork? 
Can we make some cuts or find some partnerships so that we can make this happen? Can we invest in ourselves? Because if we can't invest in ourselves, how do we expect our uh, constituents to invest in us? Why should they come around at a time of need like the last couple of sessions that we've had? Let's invest in ourselves. Let's make them believe in us. But first, we have to believe in ourselves. So what we're pro proposing is an easy, consistent, Tom, where's that shirt? <clears throat> That's not. Why do we have a blue NDSU shirt? Okay. Give me easy, <laughs> consistent, boots on the ground, internal branding campaign that empowers us to be proud of where we work and who we work for. But not only that, it allows our um, it elevates the public's perception of us, and that's our whole team's goal, is to elevate the public perception of NDSU extension. So, <laughs> with that, I tell you, you are NDSU extension. We are NDSU extension. This is NDSU extension. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> We're partnerships with Kendall. We are not Nebraska. That's who we aren't. I'm sorry. We're not trying to be mean. <laughs> you made it easy for us. So. Um, how are you going to take this to all the counties in the state and make sure everybody's participating, staff members, office members, extension agents themselves? We are proposing that NDSU Extension Administration offer each extension staff person an allocated budget to do that. Um, so we know that takes dollars, but we envision an online store where anyone can use their allocation as they see fit. It's customizable. We know we have counties out there that might already have pull-up banners, or maybe with their county commissioners, they've already partnered on um, pens or notepads or something of that nature. So not everyone has to have the same thing. You get to customize for your area and your specific needs. All right, thank you all. Attention, please. Attention, please. This is your extension director, and it's Tuesday. No, it's Thursday, and we need people for camp. Sunday. Please be at camp on Sunday. And why doesn't anybody want to be the sheep superintendent of the state fair? Well, we know that we have responsibilities. In fact, we're proud of our responsibilities, and we're passionate and we're enthousi enthusiastic about what we do. But the expectations, as the ELT promoted in their recruitment, of identifying what those true expectations are is sometimes where it becomes a little bit blurry. And in fact, we have to also answer to so many people in NDSU Extension. Those individuals are also our county commissioners, and we know that we have a responsibility at home but we'd sure like to be involved on in helping at the state level as well. We are proposing a plan for a tiered system starting with the 4-H sector, as Travis so identified, um, to target those straight 4-H responsibilities, specifically 4-H camp and superintendents at the state fair, to acknowledge the hard work, time, and dedication they provide to the residents of North Dakota State. These tasks go above and beyond the job des descriptions provided to the county commissioners and the extension staff. This incentivized system starts with a clear definition of expectations of county agents and specialists outlining state efforts in 4-H to define the regular or normal responsibilities, therefore allowing us to create a rubric to award that subsidized extra work. With our one-year pilot program, we would use the award money um, to implement this tiered incentivized system. 
and we can measure it by seeing how quickly camp chair positions fill up and other of those state level um, activities that are identified as worthy of incentivizing. And the longer term impact is uh, the increased job satisfaction that agents and specialists feel when their extraordinary efforts are rewarded and that their responsibilities, both day to day and the extraordinary, are well defined in increasing accountability and fairness across the system. Our job and task was retention of NDSU qualified staff. We look forward to uh, answering your questions on our proposed portion of this part, and we look at, uh, important to having our most important resource and commodity. It's you. Thank you. Who's here? There's Mine. <laughs> Thanks for the you have a question? Them. So, uh, are you thinking that you devise some type of form that would help in the evaluation process as you take into account all these, uh, the other responsibilities you're taking on? Right, Ken, we're talking about anything above and beyond what's already specified in a job description. So, um, our group, um, decided on like 25 key positions and that would be camp chairs first and foremost because that's where we have heard and felt the biggest struggle. And then next we would move to um, superintendents at the state fair. So those things that take us out of our normal daily activities at the county level. So of course we'd have, if awarded, a dollar amount that we could divide between those say 25, for example, 25 different positions. And they wouldn't necessarily be equal allotments. It would go off of the time based on their duties to fulfill those requirements. Of all of these requests and, and, and areas that you addressed, which is the most important? For our topic that we chose, we selected 4-H as a starting point, um, just because we all as extension agents have some sort of responsibility for 4-H, for our youth of North Dakota. Um, we can honestly see an impact with our youth um, as they come back as adults, use our services for later on use. Um, so if we focus on our youth first, and then this can overflow into other areas if it proposes to be successful and start rewarding those extra duties beyond just the 4-H segment. Dr. Charlie gave us a plan for hire, hiring qualified people, but now the next step is keeping passionate people. Team Forever 21 has designed a training system that empowers them to find and pursue their passion for their work. And it creates a whole culture of excellence that retains employees unlike any other university or company. We aren't going to offer you a shirt. We're not going to offer you a soil probe. <laughs> but we will offer you and promise you job satisfaction. What we're proposing is an entire change in the way we're training our agents as they come in in their first five to 10 years. That goal when we start for those first two years is to avoid that first year burnout while they find their passion for their career. They may be an accountant that becomes an ag, ag agent in Adams County. They may be an ag agent in a county that doesn't have the livestock species of their choice, but help them find that passion. The first phase of that is looking at that exit interview data for the people that have left. Why did they leave? What can we do? What can we do differently? The second phase 
is going to start with orientation. And this is going to be an outlined six-week orientation, not just a three-day, here's a binder, um, good luck. And then, um, so it's going to be a little bit of a in your office, so getting, you know, knowing how to answer the phone. Um, because, you know, sometimes you're day one, no, no one's even contacted you yet, and the phone rings. That's a really good experience. Um, and then uh, going to campus and touring even um, the other parts of the state, no west, east, north, south, just multidisciplinary so you understand what does the egg side of things do, what does the nutrition side of things do, what does the FCW do, um, so that can help with networking and knowing who else is um, in extension as well. And while we have that agent mentor that you're probably working with in the next county over, in that first year, try to find a mentor that's gonna model your career, not your job, as Dolly Parton would say. Find that person that first year and do some targeted mentoring. Maybe it's a research center scientist, maybe it's an uh, area extension specialist or a state specialist. What do you want your career to look like 10 years from now? Let's help you get there. The second part is chasing that passion, chasing that dream. After those first two years or year and a half, start looking at what do you want to be. Maybe you want to chase uh, certificates in, in uh, cropping science. Maybe you want to chase a master's of extension. Maybe you want to be an MS level nutritionist. They're pretty cool. Um, and you could go on and, and maybe 10 years from now you want to work for Cargill. Well, let's help you get there. Let's harness that power of NDSU to make your career what if a reality through NDSU. Our ask is we're looking for $5,000 for a pilot project for two to four agents. And we know that this is going to. So um, with this program, does this focus only on the first year of a new employee or does it expand beyond that? Great question. So no, this is actually focusing from year one really to five to seven. We really want to focus on, like we said, avoiding that first year burnout, get them to, through that first year, feel comfortable, be um, able to uh, start asking the questions because when you first start, you don't even know what questions to ask. And then really help um, the mid-year or once you get to that two to five year, we are um, start mentoring even with specialists, they have that connection with um, a agents and specialists so you can have a better um, opportunity to really set up where you want to go. The other ask is extension district directors, extension leadership to look at this as a model that's beyond the $5,000. Legislative session's coming up. This would be a great pitch. So, so are they, are the extension, you know, the agents right now set up that you could have one agent mentor another agent, a brand new agent for six weeks? Is that, is it set up that way? Right now, is that, would that be feasible to be able to do that? <laughs> what, what's your question specific? So my, my question would be, I mean, not only would you have a, a new agent that would be, you know, mentored for six weeks, but you'd also have the time factor of the existing agent. So is that feasible? Is that a... Yes, I mean, it's kind of currently done right now. I mean, we, we do have a mentorship program, but yeah, I mean, it would definitely be part of what What's we're doing. What's the current mentorship program? Um, usually you're, you're lined up with an experienced agent from somewhere else in the state, and then, and then you work um, for, to, uh, to learn. So. For how many days? For probably like a year, I'm guessing. I, don't, oh, I could okay. be wrong on some of this. I, I don't know the current it's program. Not, it's not very structured. So this would add structure to that? Yes, yes, it would be a little bit different, more intense. You'd get out of the county more, you'd be doing a lot of different things uh, okay. that you might not have the opportunity to do there, uh, a lot bit more on training. Okay, thank you. Right, that's where we'd look at master's programs, working with the research centers, uh, <laughs> specialists. <laughs> you may have lost here, but we're gonna help you win at work. <laughs> So we're the dirty worms. A common theme among evaluations is a lack of soil science knowledge. A big part of that is the lack of a tangible connection with the soil. The Soil Resource Management School will get agent, producer, crop consultant, and sister agency hands dirty and minds clean. <laughs> to do that, 
we will create the Soil Resource Management School. This will be a hands-on program that covers grazing. We'll have soil pits and we'll learn about the soil alphabet. Water management, soil management, livestock and crop integration. We're going to work with ITS and use their laptop uh, sharing program and teach people throughout the state about the web soil survey. We're going to turn white soil black through learning partnerships that improve soil salinity. Attendees will learn how to soil sample and what soil tests to conduct. Participating agents will receive a soil probe to lend out to their producers, homeowners, and community gardeners. Soil Resource Management School funds will be used to purchase of these probes and develop materials for this pilot program. And we'll learn proper form on that. <laughs> So, a lot of these materials are already available, but this program needs to be consistent, and that's where a good chunk of the funds are going to be used, is to improve that consistency. After a successful phase one, we're going to look for extramural funding, expand and improve soil resource management school. With your support, you can get a soil probe. This will improve North Dakota's most valuable resources, people and soil. And this is our tribute to American Gothic. Thank you, Louie and Tom. <laughs> They're speechless. <laughs> So I'm confused. What's what's soil sampling? What's soil sampling? That is the act of collecting soil for analysis for fertility re applications. Thank you. Thank you for reading my dissertation the other night. <laughs> Oofta, that might lower your score. As you go to the different parts of the state, will the, the sessions you develop for that part of the state uh, be similar, be customized? Uh, because it's certainly a lot different from northeastern North Dakota to southwestern North Dakota. A absolutely. For, for a first year, uh, I think we're going to focus on our team. Um, we've talked to Louie and Caitlin. They would like to do that. Um, this first year, we would like to expand uh, one more place and use a newer agent and help them get their feet on the ground. And we also want to work with the other specialists and other agents throughout the state to strengthen uh, this program. But um, there is going to be some regional uh, differences. But the outline and most of the materials will be similar, just some tweaks here and there. Would you set this up at, say, like the RECs, or how, where would you, because there's got to be an educational piece to this year and just going to disperse soil probes to everybody. Where would you, how would you do the educational piece of this? So, so the educational piece, we want to, that's where some of those learning partnerships come into play, and we want to do it out in farmers' fields. We want hands-on stuff. I mean, there's certain materials that you can't do but need hands-on. 